Doug, thank you, and you may be seated, and thank you again for joining us today for this hour of worship. And we hope and pray that God will uh, continue to renew our spirits as we gather in his name to praise him, the only true and living God. And it's just great to see all of you and see those that are visiting with us today. Uh, we hope and pray that uh, you will come again and uh, be with us on any occasion that God may give you the opportunity. And, uh, you know, we're saddened this morning by the death of our brother, Bert Reichard. And let's continue to keep that family in our prayers. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is your soul for sale? You know, sometimes in life we might answer the question in the negative. But by our actions, you would be led to believe that the souls of some are up for bargains, for sale. And it's a question that we need to stop and ask ourselves every day. Would I sell my soul if the price is right? You know, people are selling their souls every day. And Jesus spoke of it, actually, in his ministry. And, you know, it's so convenient, isn't it? Just sign your name. Sometimes we sign our lives away. And Jesus, to that end, would write in Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give? You ever thought about it? What would you give for your soul? Some people say, well, I wouldn't give anything for my soul. My soul is going to heaven. I hope that it is. But unless we amend our ways, in many cases, that will not be true. That's why Jesus said that. Well, what will a man exchange his soul? I know people sell their souls because Isaiah 52 and verse 3 confirms it. He said, for thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught. People sell a lot of things, their houses, their cars, their personal belongings. But too often, they sell their soul. Like these who sold out. Wouldn't it be a horrible thing to stand before the great God of the universe someday in that hour of judgment and you have to confess that you sold out to sin? To sin. Our souls at times, as I said, have a price tag. Oh, you didn't intend to sell your soul, but what you did, relatively speaking, resulted in the sale of your soul. If you died today, where would you go? Brother Riker just passed away a few moments ago. We have every reason to believe that he was ushered by the angels into the presence of God. What a joy. Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord God. And for me to live is Christ, but for me to die is gain. So for Brother Bert Reichert, it was gain today. Sometimes we look at it as a tragic event. But when one goes to be with God, is it really a tragedy? Oh, we'll miss him. We'll miss him sitting back there by you all, Jerry. He'll be missed by his family. He'll be missed by those that knew him and loved him. But we have every right to believe that he now has gone to wait the great judgment day that shall befall all of us. For Hebrews 9 and 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment. You know, that's an awesome hour. I remember Brother Joe Gay. Many of you probably remember him. He was an elder in our church for a long, long time. Had a place of business out on West Oak. Had a nursery, plant nursery. 
And I'll never forget, first time I walked into his place of business and I was looking around, casually pursuing what he had, there was a big clock at the back there and underneath the clock it had, of all these hours, fear one. And that's the day, the hour of judgment. If you were to die today, where would you go? For the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, Peter writes to Christians and says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, where will be the end or what will be the end of those who obey not the gospel of God? That's why it's so important today, if you're not a Christian, that you obey the gospel. That's why it's so important for you to acknowledge your belief in Christ and turn from your sin through your repentance and be immersed in water baptism that God might forgive you of every transgression in your life. But that, my friend, is a big question, isn't it? And he asked it in question form. If, if judgment begins at the house of God, where will the sinner and those who obey not the gospel be? Where will you be when life is over here? That's a good question, isn't it? You know, too many times in our life, we go through life living our life as the way we want to live it. But where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Will you go to heaven? Do you know that you will? Marty, I think our actuator is not working here. Where will you go? Many are troubled by that one question. A lot of people don't like for preachers to get up and preach about death or to talk about eternity or talk about the way they live their lives here. But where will you go? Where will you be, Marty? You know, hell is a real place. Sometimes people think that hell is somewhat of a mythological place, but it's not. Hell is real. It is real. It's referred to as the place where the worm dieth not, and that fire is not quenched. What does the Bible teach about the fate of the one who doesn't know God? Well, let me share with you what the Bible says. Even though it is referred to in the book of Mark, chapter 9, as by Jesus who said this, it's the place where the fire is not quenched. The Bible in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, makes this observation, verse 7 through 9. He says that the people that refuse to obey the gospel and know not God will be lost in an eternal fire. Now that's what God says. Many, and there's several things I want to share with you today. First of all, many sell out to sin. And that's why there is such a need for salvation. Jesus died upon the cross that we might go to heaven. The reason we will go to heaven is because we accepted Christ as our Lord. And we applied his blood to our life. Because all of us have sinned. For the book of Romans 3 and 23 says that the, listen, he says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Think about it. Every one of us are sinners before God. And had it not been for the death of Jesus Christ our Lord, we, will all, we would all be lost. Our souls would have been forfeited forever and forever. Our sin separates us from God. If you were to notice here this depiction, we sin and what happens, we die. And when we die, someday you're going to face God. But the Bible in the book of Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says that the Lord's arm is not so short that he can't reach you. And neither is he deaf that he can't hear you. But your sins have separated you from your God. 
In Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But I'm afraid that many of us are ashamed of the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God, Paul writes, revealed from faith to faith as it is written in that little book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament that the just shall live by faith. You know, faith's a big word, isn't it? No, oh, it's a small word, but it's a big word. <laughs> we use it a lot in today's world. People say, oh, you're, you're saved by your faith in God. All you have to do is acknowledge God through faith that you believe that he is the Son of God. But that isn't what Jesus taught. Jesus taught that we must obey the gospel. We must believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. But we must act out that form of doctrine based upon the book of Romans chapter 6 and allow our faiths to cause us to obey God. All have sinned, but the gospel is the answer to man's salvation. That's why Paul writes in that particular text right there in the book of Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of it. I glory in it. I delight in it. Therefore, the gospel is to be preached to all. And you know what? That's what we do in this congregation, isn't it? In the book of Mark chapter 16, we try to declare that message of salvation around the world. And Christ said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be condemned. You know what? It's a message that's not being heralded in many churches today any longer. And that's a shame, isn't it? We call this the Great Commission, Commission. We work at it together. It is what Christ left his disciples. Think about it. These were his last words to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Christ set the example for all of us in Matthew chapter 3. When he was baptized by the hands of John. And we must do the same. All sin. So all are lost whether they realize it or not. Acts chapter 17. All are lost because they're under the penalty of death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says... That the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But there's a second thing I want you to know here this morning. And that is, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Where would you be? Do you know for sure this morning that if you died, you'd go to heaven? Do you know without any reservation at all that you would claim the wonderful home that God is preparing for those who are faithful unto him. Jesus sought to be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. Big question, isn't it? Where will the ungodly and the sinner be? That's a question of rhetoric, isn't it? Christ knew, and we know, do we not? where the sinner and the ungodly will be when life is over here? We surely know. In the book of Romans 1, verse 18 through 32, the Bible talks about the wrath of God falling upon men. And it says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. You don't have to get out and preach against the truth. You don't have to get out and run preachers down. You don't have to get out and run the church down and talk about how important the, or how unimportant the church really is because by your wickedness and by your sinfulness, you are doing it already. Some people come to the cross only to leave it. Isn't that a shame? That some people come to Jesus and they hear the message of Christ and they walk away. For in the book of John chapter 6... 
The Bible says that when Jesus began to speak about the celebration feast that we just engaged in this morning, the breaking of the bread and the drinking of that fruit of the vine, Jesus said, unless you partake of it, you will die. And the Bible says that many of them from that time forward walked with him no more. Many walk away. They continue down the same old path, just deeper and deeper into the sinful condition of life. In Romans 1, 18 through 23, Paul talks about that sinful condition. And he says that when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be so wise... They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up. Did you know there's no other passage in all the Bible that speaks of God giving up on some people? But these were ungodly people. They didn't worship God. They weren't concerned about heaven. They were selling their soul and they were delighting in it. For the Bible says they changed the truth of God into a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. And for this cause, God gave them up. Let me ask you a question this morning. How far would you have to go before God would give you up? I've known some people I think God gave up who never became children of God. They lived their wicked life. I had a neighbor many years ago who told me, not here in Palestine, but where I grew up, And I was talking to her about the Lord even as a young man. And she told me, she says, I'm going to hell and you're not going to change that. I thought to myself, yes, you are. You you absolutely will be. But the Bible says those who knew the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they don't only do it, but they have pleasure in them that do them. That's a great tragedy, isn't it? But thirdly, all of us are without excuse. You know, we, we excuse ourselves so many times in life, don't we, about a lot of things. Someone said if we don't want to do something, one excuse, I guess, is good as another. It's like people that make excuses sometimes where they don't come to worship. I've, I've wondered in my mind, if it weren't for the pandemic, would they show up? If they don't use that as an excuse, and let's say, for instance, that it's totally eradicated, do you think people will show up? Some will. Some won't. I've told you many times, you miss church long enough, and you won't miss it. It won't be important to you anymore. Ungodliness and unrighteousness suppresses the truth. And that's what happened in Noah's day in Genesis chapter 6. The world was so wicked, so grossly wicked, that God said enough is enough. I will destroy man whom I have created. But you see, sin blinds us to the truth. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said that the devil has blinded our hearts and our minds to the truth. Do you know many people are blind to the word of God today? They are. 2 Corinthians 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, little g, that's talking about the devil, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And I've come to the conclusion that if you don't want to believe in God, God will send you a strong delusion, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where you will turn away from the truth and you will lose your soul forever and forever, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. All are without excuse. 
A lot of people are going to have them. In the day of judgment, Jesus talked about many of the excuses that people had. He spoke about, parabolically speaking, about a lot of excuses that people have today for not following him. You remember when he gave the parable of the supper and everything was all ready and he says now I want you to go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in that my house may be filled and they went out and they began to tell them about the great supper of the Lord and many says well you know uh, I have bought some oxen and I need to go prove them I need to make sure that they're all right or I've bought some land and I've got to go see that land and many of them made one excuse right after another. They chose to reject God and his truth. And man has often refused the testimony of God. Therefore, they're without excuse. I've told you many times, there won't be any excuses in the day of judgment. There won't be. Not acceptable excuses. But I can tell you that the devil will be waiting for you in hell to offer you a big welcome. For it's a place, the Bible says, that's prepared for the devil and his angels. And many are heading straight to hell today as I speak. Many give in to the worldly pleasures of life and the earthly desires instead of honoring God. And when man lost God, he lost everything. All without excuse, because they cease to honor God. When you don't honor God, I've heard people say, Oh, I want to go to heaven. Why would you want to go to heaven? Why in the name of Jehovah God would you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven just to escape hell? Or do you want to go to heaven because you love God? I would doubt their sincerity when they don't honor him here and when they don't thank him here. You'd never convince me you'd honor God in heaven. You'd probably long for earth if you got there. People began to elevate themselves when they don't love God, when they don't thank God. They begin to extol their own virtues. They begin to talk about how great they are. That's exactly what they did. They worshiped creatures more than God. Can you imagine people today worshiping cows and pigs and dogs and animals instead of worshiping the God of heaven? When it comes to obeying God, folks, there is no excuse for your excuses. They began to worship things that were created. That's what idolatry is, isn't it? That's why Moses would pin the words on those stones that were emblazoned by God that says, You shall have no other God before me and Christ taught the same thing and the truth is exchanged for a lie I never understood that my people would exchange the truth for a lie but again when Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica he says you know what God will send you a strong delusion that you will believe a lie and be damned. There are many false religions and systems that have developed over a period of time in our country. We were once a Christian nation, but we've become a nation of Muslims. We've become a nation of people who worship Buddha. But worse than that, we have become a nation that worships money and material things. And that is the object of our commitment. It is the object of our devotion. And it's more important to us than anything else. You listen to people talk. How many people around you in daily conversation talk about God? Do you ever bring him up in a conversation? 
You ever talk about Jehovah? You ever talk to your friends about Jesus? Our country has become chaotic, morally speaking. When people believe that homosexual marriage is acceptable in the eyes of God, God made him male and female. And when you go to change your gender, what you are saying is that God made a mistake. You should have been a woman. Or you should have been a man. And you have changed what God made you to be. How would you like to stand before God as a transgender and say, God, here I am. Our world is in chaos. Our country is. And we believe that it's right to take a young, innocent baby out of its mother's womb, slit its throat, cut it to pieces, and reason within our minds that God approves that. You see, God made order out of chaos, not chaos out of order. Genesis chapter 1, for the Bible says the world was void and without order. But it seems as though people get it wrong today. You know why they get it wrong? They want to get it wrong. They want to get it wrong. But thank God for those who are pursuing godliness in a godless world. Titus chapter 1, verse 1 through 9. But number four. I can't help but think about the sadness of it all. For God says they will be left to their own devices. Their own devices. And hell will be their home. Where will the sinner and the ungodly be? Some people try to make a deal with the devil. And what they do is they try to be a devil or to live like the world and yet hold hands with God at the same time. In the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus said that you cannot serve two masters. You will either love one and despise the other or you will hate one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And yet we have people in the world that are trying and isn't it a sad thing to think that in that hour of judgment when we all stand before our God, Matthew 25, we will look back too often times with regret and think about what might have been, what might have been if we'd really put God first in our life. God has reached out to man but he doesn't force us to obey. If he forced you to obey him, it wouldn't be that you were honoring him out of love anyway, would it? You'd be honoring him out of coercion. Not because you really love God. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. Whether you believe it or not, you're not getting to heaven without expressing your love for Jehovah God. If man will not turn to God, God will let him go. He will. Ephesians 4, verse 17 and 18 says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their own mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of their blindness of heart. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 
And what does the Bible teach about the fate of the one who does not know God? You see, there's a difference between knowing the book as Dwight has that on church sign. And by the way, congratulations again, Dwight, for 20 years of serving and putting those signs up there. That's a very difficult thing to do that. You may not realize how difficult it is, but it is. But he does it to propagate the gospel and to get you to think. But too many, many times, people fail. And there's a difference between knowing this book and knowing God. And he says those that don't, you may know the book, but if you don't know God, you're lost. Only death awaits the unrepentant. That's what he says. Wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. And what you're saying every day when you fail to become a Christian is that my soul is for sale. Do I have any offers? Any offers out there? That's what you're saying, folks, whether you realize it or not. But number five, and this is the beauty of all of it, folks, is that all of us can turn back. We all make mistakes. We all are. We make matters uh, terrible mistakes and matters of judgment at times. But eventually when man rejects God and his truth, think about all the people that are led astray by the way you live. Whole societies and cultures do not know God nor his truth. But think about the people you could lead to Christ by your example. Ignorance of God doesn't make the sinner free from the price of their sin. You've heard people say, well, what about all those people that have never heard about God? Man must choose to turn from his own way and seek God. You don't become a Christian because your wife is a Christian. I've seen people get baptized maybe before they marry and sometimes right after they marry because the wife's a member of the church. Or I've seen sometimes wives become obedient in baptism and they do it for the wrong reason. You don't do it for your husband. You do it for the Christ who died for your sin. One of the saddest statements in the Bible is found in the book of Romans 3 and verse 11 where it says, None seeketh after the Lord. Have you ever felt maybe that you'd committed the unpardonable sin? Sometimes people say, Well, I think maybe I have committed the unpardonable sin. I sold my soul to Satan. Is it possible for you to buy it back again? No, but it's possible for God to buy it. It's possible for the blood of Jesus Christ to cover you. Everyone can choose to turn back to God, but the real issue and the question is, will they? Will they? The Bible is plain on the end of those who know not God and those who do not render obedience to the gospel message of Christ. Someday it will be too late, and the Bible in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8-9 says Christ is coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ, who shall be punished. Listen to it. You wonder what happens? I can answer Peter's question about where will the sinner and the ungodly be. For he says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's what he says. And that's why God said through Isaiah in Isaiah 45 and 22, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. None. Your only hope is God. We must share the gospel with the lost, that they too can be saved from the wrath that is to come. And by the way, in John 4 and 35, 
Jesus said the harvest is white, ready. And it's up to us to be harvesters in the vineyard of God. We have to leave the sin, but don't leave God. That's the worst mistake you will ever, ever make in your life. God's plan for your salvation is as plain as anything you could ever imagine. You ever thought about it? How to get to heaven? If the sinner and the unrighteous and the ungodly are going to hell, how do I get to heaven? What do I have to do? Well, let me share with you how you do it. You have to hear the word of God, first of all. You'll never be able to know it unless you heard it. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? And then you must believe it. For John 8, 24 says, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sin. And where I go, you cannot come. And you must be willing to be penitent over your sin. That doesn't mean to be sorry. Most people are sorry. Sometimes people are sorry they got caught. But repentance means to change. It's not the Bible in Romans 2 and 4 says that godly sorrow bringeth about repentance. But repentance is not just being sorryful or mournful over your sin. But repentance means that you're willing to change whatever is amiss or wrong in your life. And confess with your lips the thing that Christ has asked you to do. He said, if men will confess me before other men, then someday I will confess them before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, and you don't have to do it with words, you can deny God by not becoming a Christian. You can deny God by not becoming obedient to the faith. And offering excuses why you didn't. And then one must be immersed in water baptism. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Did you know the Bible in this passage says that we're saved by water? Read it. It's what the Word of God says. And Jesus commissioned it and commanded it. And in Acts 22 and verse 16, when Paul was lost in his sin before he became a Christian. Ananias said to him, And now Saul, why tarryest thou arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it's not enough just to get baptized, folks. you got to be faithful to God. For when Peter wrote those words that we read to you early on, if judgment begins at the house of God, you know what the house of God is? The church. And if it begins at the church, where will the sinner and the ungodly be? Sometimes people leave the Lord and they turn back. They're not really committed unto God. In the year 1904, William Borden, who was heir to the Borden Dairy Estate, graduated from Chicago High School. And he did it, believe it or not, as a millionaire. He graduated from high school as a millionaire. His parents gave him a trip around the world. He traveled through Asia. He traveled through the Mideast, through Europe. And it gave Borden a burden for the people of the world who were lost and alienated from God. Riding back home, he said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. And when he had made that decision, he wrote in the back of his Bible two words. The words, no, no reserves, no reserves. Turning down tremendous offers for employment, after he graduated from Yale University, he entered two more words in his Bible. It was the words, no retreat. I won't leave what I'm committed to doing. And when he completed his studies at Princeton, Borden sailed to China to teach the gospel to those that were Muslims. Stopped 
first at Egypt to make preparation. But while he was there, he developed spinal meningitis, and he died within a month. A waste, you say? No. Not in God's plan for him, or it wouldn't have happened? No. But in his Bible, underneath the words, no retreat and no reserve, were the last two words that he wrote, no regrets, no regrets. When your life comes to an end, as it did with our brother today, where will you be? You know, God has so many wonderful blessings awaiting us in heaven. He does a warehouse full of them. But it's up to us to claim them, to be baptized, and wash away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, Peter wrote, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. What he's saying is make sure about your relationship with God. And I will tell you this morning, up front here, if you doubt your salvation, does it mean that you're truly saved? I'm telling you, if you doubt your salvation, you probably are not. Because the devil places doubt in your mind. Don't go to hell with doubt in your mind. And I close with this passage from the Old Testament, the book of Job 7, verse 1 and 2. Is there not an appointed time to man upon this earth? But the Burt Reichard's time came. The appointed time. And the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And Job says, are not his days also like the days of a hireling? As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, a place of rest. And as a hireling looketh for the reward of his work. Is that not the way it is with us? We must admit our wrong and ask God to forgive us as God's children and to renew our relationship with him. This morning, can you truthfully say, God, forgive me and change me as we stand together and as we sing.